Mozart. It was the late 1700s, a time when most Americans made a living through farming. Others sold, traded, or bartered for goods made at home or in small shops. Each horseshoe, each boot, each yard of cloth was made from beginning to end by the same two hands. We are destitute of a person acquainted with water frame spinning. If thy present situation does not come up with what thou wisheth, come and work ours, and have the credit as well as the advantage of perfecting the first water mill in America. Moses Brown replying to Samuel Slater's inquiry. It appears that Samuel Slater found something special here in the Blackstone Valley. Opportunity. It was here on the banks of the Blackstone River by the falls of Pawtucket where the critical parts fell into place that would start America's journey into an industrialized world. Capital supplied by Omni and Brown. Samuel Slater with his knowledge and skill, craftsmanship and knowledge of metalworking that came from a variety of local men in the area and of course the Blackstone River which gave the capital, the knowledge and skill, the power to turn their dreams into reality. Men of ideas? Absolutely. Risk takers? No question. These young entrepreneurs of the new republic were charting a course toward industrialization that would soon be followed and copied by others. Hi, this is Ranger Chuck Arding with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And it is well recognized that Slater Mill is a defining example of America's earliest factory system and its path to industrialization. That's why Congress and the National Park Service designated it as a national landmark. The question is, is there somewhere else in the Blackstone Valley that also tells the story of America's early industrialization better than any place else in America? Is there some other piece of the landscape here that truly is nationally significant? Well, that's a pretty good question, and Congress was wondering the same thing. So they commissioned a special resource study to come here to the Blackstone Valley researched and explored the valley to determine if there truly is a national story here. Well, I'm going to need your help because that's a pretty tall order. So why don't you join me and my ranger colleagues as we explore the Blackstone Valley, trying to find out if it truly is and truly can raise the level of a national park. Blackstone Valley, we have essentially a river that was turned into an engineering resource, uh, harnessed by dams at every available foot of drop on the river. And behind those dams, ponds are creating. Upstream on tributary brooks and creeks, swamps were turned into reservoirs to hold water that could then flow downstream during the dry summer months. In effect, the entire watershed of the Blackstone River was turned in to a water supply and delivery system that was going to turn mill wheels and run factory machinery. Coming into the Blackstone Valley, really the first thing that really strikes you are the mill villages. And by that I don't mean the mills, I mean the mill villages. This is a, uh, a thing that began here in the Blackstone Valley. They first appeared here and then they spread over the Northeast and beyond, where you had the mill established, and because it was in a remote location, the mill owner had to provide housing for his workers. And the first ones were small, but as industry grew, the villages grew as well. Welcome to Slatersville, Rhode Island, the site of America's first planned industrial mill village, opening in 1807 when John and Samuel Slater began production of cotton here at the mill, powered by the Branch River. 
Now behind me, you can see uh, the company stores that were established here by the Slaters. And stores like this were a critical element to the development of a mill village. When the Slaters came out here, they had a wonderful source of water power, but not a whole lot else. So in order to support the workers they were bringing here, they had to build a village. And that village included elements such as mill housing, churches, schools, and these wonderful company stores. And besides providing for the basic needs of their workers, the store buildings also offered a recreational opportunity as the upstairs rooms were available for activities such as quilting bees, parties, and other activities, even at sometimes having a place to show movies in later days. In the Blackstone Valley, you can see them essentially as they were when they were in their heyday. They're still tucked down there in the river valley. Uh, the modern suburbanization has not encroached on them, and you can really get the sense that these men, women, and children had when they woke up in the morning to the ringing of the bell. They walked into the mill to the ringing of the bell, and they started work to the ringing of the bell. And basically, the rest of the day went the same way. They'd break for lunch, they'd go home, and for the kids, when that curfew bell rang at 9 o'clock, they were supposed to be home in bed. And that is one of the things that you see in the Blackstone Valley, not just once, not just twice, but what's amazing about it is we have a region here. We don't just have one isolated example. One Slater Mill, as important as it is, does not make the Blackstone Valley. It's the fact that we have what Slater demonstrated could be done at Slater Mill, then taken up and replicated and made successful at dozens of locations. And that is industrialization. It's not just coming up with a way to do it. It's coming up with a way to do it and then replicating it and having the effects of that start to transform an entire society. And you can see the sort of the crystallized blueprint of industrialization right here in the Blackstone Valley from that pioneering era all the way up to the 20th century. If you were to go to China or places that are going through their own industrialization now, you would see elements of the things that Slater introduced here and the residents of the Blackstone Valley took up, adopted, experienced, tweaked, changed, but ultimately made their life for a critical century in the development of this country. And that combination of, of risk-taking capital, that sort of artisanal technological know-how that the artisans in, in Pawtucket and the Blackstone Valley had, and that knowledge of the new technology and how to apply it and how to organize a workforce uh, that Slater brought with him all combined. And any one of those things existed in other places. It was the importance of bringing them all together in one place. And some people want to give all the credit to Slater. He deserves a lot. But we don't want to forget that it was Moses Brown and his desire to plant the seed of this new economy. That was a very conscious intention on his part, to start something new in a big way. Uh, prior to the, the corridor designation, we had started a heritage park here in, in Uxbridge, and uh, uh, that was uh, funding was acquired for that in the late 70s, and then being developed in the during the 1980s, uh, when staff were assigned to the park and uh, some of the features started to take shape. Around the same time, uh, some of the leaders and, and people of the in the Blackstone South uh, portion, really the uh, the Rhode Island area, saw the desire to maybe create some kind of a park entity along the river as well. But I think that was the um, the interest in saying, well, could we look at this in another way? Look at whether the idea of a national park made sense. Uh, we were able to get the congressional delegation uh, at the time. We were able to get first to get the national parks was to do a study to determine whether or not um, the national park model would work, uh, and if not, what else, would there be another way to, to focus on the national uh, prominence of the, the valley as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution? What I remember about the, the period in the 70s and early 80s was that everybody had a historic site that they thought was the most important site in the world, but certainly in the Blackstone Valley. But none of the sites related to any of the other sites. And everybody was very concerned about the Blackstone Canal, but it was just the canal. 
And what I've seen since 1986 is that the sites are all connected to each other, not in terms of ownership, but in terms of their stories. And the story of the canal is the story of the Wilbur Kelly House. And the story of the Kelly House relates to the story of Great Road. And the mill villages in Massachusetts, the mill villages in Rhode Island have connections to each other. Whereas 20 years ago, these were just separate strands of thread lying on the floor. Now they've been woven together into a piece of cloth. A special resource study is a technical report to Congress and it responds to the question about whether or not the resources in the Blackstone Valley meet a, an established criteria for possible inclusion in the national park system. So the focus of the study is the question of whether or not there should be a unit of the national park system here in, in the Blackstone. They have asked us to focus on the story of industrialization in American history Although we understand that there are lots of other really important stories in the valley, that is the focus of the study, is to look at this as the cradle of the um, American industrial history in the United States. Um, the criteria we use involves three primary steps. We look at its national significance, which is why the sites and resources here in the valley are important in the context of American history um, and American culture. We look at it from a suitability standpoint to help us understand whether there are other resources that represent similar themes that are already available to the public and how they would compare to the resources that we have here in the Blackstone Valley. And then we also look at it from a feasibility standpoint. And that's looking at things like, you know, is there a real need for the National Park Service to be involved here? Are there resources that require our protection? Um, if there are resources that require our protection, are they suitable, are they, are they manageable? Um, can we administer them within um, a reasonable way? Are they accessible to the public? Um, what are the ownership patterns? Those kinds of things um, relate to the feasibility analysis. When the study is complete, we will have arrayed a number of alternatives to look at different management possibilities for the valley. The final result of the study process is a report that will have gone through public review and fairly significant agency review that's delivered to Congress and ultimately it will be Congress's decision as to whether or not a unit of the national park system is established here in the Blackstone Valley. So in order to make this very difficult determination of whether there are nationally significant uh, resources here in the valley, I should say by resources we mean things, cultural resources like buildings, structures, collections, archives, and archaeological sites, even if they're still in the ground. So to make this determination as to whether they're nationally significant, to try to make it more objective and impartial, we decided to bring in a group of visiting scholars who had expertise, especially in this field of industrial and social history. We went through kind of a long selection process to come up with six outstanding recognized scholars who were not from the Blackstone Valley, so it would be objective and impartial. And when they came here back in February, we spent a total of three days for about a day and a half. They toured around the valley looking at some of the most important sites. And then we had a day and a half of very intense panel discussions among all of us. And then finally they made a public presentation in Whitensville before they left that the river is the spine. The river is what really defines this region in large part. Um, it forms for the public a focal point for the story of those multiple paths to industrialization, but it also knits together the valley's distinctive environment of mill communities, mill villages, uh, and agricultural hinterlands, which is, is what really makes this, this region so significant. Uh, the Blackstone River was described as the hardest working or one of the hardest working rivers in the United States because of its role in the industrializing landscape. It provided the power for the mills uh, witnessing the beginnings of industrial development but also its decline. The river itself tells a very powerful story of how the landscape was engineered to meet the needs of industrialism. 
uh, many of them do disappear. They're not sustained. Uh, in my own neck of the woods in Chester County, right below Philadelphia, before you get to Delaware, there's lots of this happening, but a lot of it has disappeared by the 1860s, 1870s. But many periods, in many places, they endure and continue to contribute to this great leap of the United States to industrial preeminence by the beginnings of the 20th century. Um, and there's no better place, actually, to see it, to understand it, uh, than the Blackstone River corridor. Uh, because um, not only do we have the creation of these mill village communities uh, with uh, extraordinary production systems and technological innovation, but it, what is remarkable to me about the, the corridor is the density of these villages, um, their interactions, we'll hear more about that, their interconnections, their contributions not only to gross national product uh, and technological in, um, innovation, but what I find quite distinctive is their endurance. These villages are not naturally evolving. They were planned, they were built by the companies, uh, they were tended to be built of a piece, very unlike a, a, a natural organic kind of settlement. Um, and it's this cultural landscape of villages that we can look to to see as a visible expression of workers and workers' lives. Their, their homes, are, I think, are extremely evocative of the people that were within them. Workers built the mills. <coughs> workers made the mills run. And in a very important sense, I think, workers made the valley. I'm not sure this is a new perspective, but it, perhaps one that deserves um, continued emphasis, perhaps even new emphasis. This is a labor, labor force that continuously moved between uh, farm and factory. It's not farm to factory, it's farm and factory. It was a continuing oscillation, reminding us that this is um, a, a kind of industrialization that occurred not in cities, though there are cities, but it's, just, it's deeply and importantly rural industrialization. Sometime in the 1830s, President Andrew Jackson came to see Samuel Slater. And he said to him something on the order, so you're the fellow who started all this. And Slater responded, I gave out the lines, and they've been singing them ever since. You want to talk about importance? This is where the cotton industry began. This is where this incredibly important global and regional phenomena. We've heard about this, uh, uh, one of extraordinary significance in American history. Its history is the story of the cultivation of cotton and the tragedy of slavery in the Civil War. It's a story that extends to the clothing shops of New York City. It's a story that continued in the South, continued further south in Colombia, other parts of South America continues today in China, global and regional. Great, great significance in this valley. It's not totally present-minded to say this was the Silicon Valley of the 19th century. It's still here in a way that's uh, visually and in artifact form is, is intact. There's no place else in the United States like this that epitomizes that particular transformation throughout the 19th century. And this network community preceded Silicon Valley by 150 years. These were machinists that helped each other out, they supported their careers, they communicated, they traveled, they went around shops, shared information and expertise. And so in fact, the machinery works of uh, Providence, Pawtucket area and other parts of the valley and Philadelphia are actually linked together in that technological expertise and transference of employees and skilled managers. They're linked to the Patterson machine shops in there that go on to in the, eventually go on to locomotives. They're linked to the Lowell machine shops, the Colt Armory in Springfield, and it goes on and on and on. The result is the Blackstone Valley. What is so significant far about it is as an industrial district bookend by Providence and Worcester and mill villages up and down the valley. It's an extraordinary industrial district that we can see tightly integrated within, but also elsewhere in the east. And that's really what that stands as an enormously important uh, place. We said at the outset we were not necessarily looking for consensus, that they all had to agree on whatever it was. But it turned out at the end of this session, they really did agree. And um, what surprised me, and maybe even surprised them, was how impressed they all were with what they saw here in the valley. 
They had no doubt that it was of national significance. They found that it was significant over a very long period of time, uh, not only back to the period of Samuel Slater, but far deep into the 20th century. And I think the most important point they came up with was that the significance was more than just any one site or more than any two or three sites. It was an accumulation or an aggregation of all the important sites that conveyed this, this facet of American industrial history over that long period of time. In other words, it was the totality of it, the, the aggregate was much more important so that you had a really important, significant industrial district here in the Blackstone Valley that uh, they all felt was unrivaled anywhere in the country. Since Congress authorized the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor in 1986, and even before that time, a group of citizens have worked with the National Park Service and Congress to make the region's story nationally significant. This group of passionate, dedicated citizens from all walks of life have really made the valley a special place. Let's hear their thoughts. Our history has always been here, but it's been kept up uh, by the great historical societies and historic district commissions and the good boards and commissions that we have in all the towns, in all, in all of our valley towns. They've always done a great job, so the history's always been here. But we always thought it was our history, our village's history, our town's history, our state's history. We never really thought of it as telling a national story. So the corridor has allowed us to say, there's really a national story here, and it's up to these people in the 24 cities and towns to help tell it. So that gave us opportunity. From a perspective, from my perspective, um, uh, my interest is how we can bring visitors here to enjoy the resources and help us achieve a better community, a healthy community, a livable community. So when the Corridor Commission became authorized, it was like manna from heaven. Now we have uh, the good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will. We have the National Park Service is saying that we're important. In fact, they're actually going to be here with us in uniform helping us to tell the story. The Slater Mill is the icon of the, of the, of the car and the valley. I think um, the Slater Mill tells the beginning of the story and then the rest of the story gets told throughout the car, whether it's the <clears throat> farm to industry, whether it's the industrial villages, whether it's the, um, the small mills, the development of the river for water power. Those, that story gets tell, told in various locations around the corridor, but the mill that's here at Slater is where it all started. What I like about the Heritage Corridor concept is that you, go, you can change your own community, you can be involved in your own community, you can preserve your own community. And I think that the Heritage Corridor gives you an opportunity to influence your landscape, um, and um, to feel a lot of pride in what you're doing and to turn something important over to your children and have them involved too. My husband always tells the story of when we first moved to Grafton in 1970, um, we got to know Jerry Gaudette, who was our insurance agent, and Jerry had a dog, and the dog swam in the river, and the dog died. Clean Water Act was passed in 1972, so the water was, God awful. But my husband continues with the story. Now our dog jumps in the river. He's perfectly healthy when he comes out and the river has improved tremendously. Um, at, in the early 70s we had only two species of fish living in the main stem. We had white sucker and carp. They can live in anything but now we have 19 different species in the main stem. The improvements in water quality has just brought that diversity from the tribs into the main stem as far as the number of fish. And everybody is proud to say they're from the Blackstone Valley. And everyone talks about, if you look in the yellow pages these days and see how many businesses now are named, have the word Blackstone in there the name of their business, it's remarkable. It, it's just remarkable. So it's this real sense of pride that uh, the Car Heritage Quarter has brought to us. I remember that when I came on to the commission back in the 1990s, I believe, I was really struck by how bold the 
vision was and bold, how bold the projects were as well and how successful they were even though they were bold and very ambitious. We had tremendous success with historic preservation. We were cleaning up the river successfully. Uh, we were doing it in a way that the people and the communities of the valley discovered for themselves why the valley was so significant, what the significant history was, what the story was that we have to tell here. And because you got that awareness and that growing pride, this, be, this became like a catalyst for additional successes where um, whole communities really saw revitalization happening because of the cultural and the historic preservation and then the environmental improvements, economic development became possible. I remember in Ashton when um, you know, developers finally began to believe that it made sense economically to redevelop that mill complex. The model that was put in place here, which is really all about partnership, it's not about government telling people what's important or what they should do or how they should do it. Government really had a more modest role of making some resources available and with that encourage the local citizens and communities to take on projects, take initiatives, uh, set high goals, and above all to work together and that's the other thing we often talked about in government how important it was to have the towns collaborate with one another or government and non-government but here it was actually happening having looked into the valley and now actually living in worcester massachusetts and regularly traveling the corridor to providence rhode island i'm simply always amazed at the richness of this region and the connectedness and just how much the past cast its shadow over the region and I think that's something we would, I wouldn't necessarily understand without the Corridor Commission and the National Park Service work in the region. Because even when I get lost, and I still get lost if I take the byways off 146, I find there's things that excite me because I don't necessarily know the story of the individual mill structures, but I know the greater narrative of which they're a part now that the Park Service has helped to really spread the message of, of its importance to the region and its identity. And that's the big difference that excites me, that wherever I am in the valley, I know I stand in the midst of a deep past, and I know where I am. I think a really key step has already been taken, and that was when the Congress directed the National Park Service to study the importance of the Blackstone Valley as a first step toward creating a new national historical park here. And that study has now been released, at least in draft form, we know the, conc the conclusions of the historians at the National Park Service. It seems to me they had three important conclusions. First, they reaffirmed the importance of Slater Mill as the birthplace of the American cotton textile industry. Their second conclusion was a little broader. They looked at the whole Blackstone Valley, and they said that the Blackstone Valley as a whole was central to the process of industrialization in America for a period of at least 100 years. And the third conclusion, I think, is the most important of all, because they said that the places where this history was made are still here, that the historic places of the Blackstone Valley are the best place to tell this nationally important story, better than anywhere else in the United States. I think those conclusions will now lead the National Park Service, the U.S. Congress, and all of us here in the Valley to take a look at what we can do to make sure that this national story is protected and preserved. And in my view, uh, a new national historical park is the right answer. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And there's lots of special places in the Blackstone Valley, but probably the most special thing about the Blackstone Valley is the people. The people who worked here, who made their living here, who made the valley what it is, and the people today who are preserving this industrial landscape for all the treasure and all to see. So next time, see you in the Blackstone Valley.